live from downtown Detroit. Local 4 News at 5 starts now. 80s in Chicago right now, low 70s in the UP. Which of those air masses is going to be here for the weekend? All right, Ben, also doctors treating the officers stabbed in the Flint terror attack deliver an update, and it's good news. But we begin with this man, now charged with the murder and the death of a three-year-old in Clinton Township. Thanks for being with us today. Lamont Odell Johnson was formally charged with second-degree murder and the death of three-year-old Cameron Dillard. Cameron died after police say he picked up Johnson's gun and fired it. Priya Mann was in court today as Priya, a chilling coincidence, came to light in this case. The victim in this case is a three-year-old boy, and the owner of the gun used in this deadly shooting, he's a father of a three-year-old boy himself. Lamont Johnson's family says this is a tragedy for everyone involved. It wasn't his intention, and I know my brother is not because he have kids of his own. It's just been real hard. I feel they pain and stuff like that, but just like the judge said, he shouldn't have had a gun in his possession. 29-year-old Lamont Johnson faces life in prison after a child allegedly found his gun and killed himself. On Tuesday, three-year-old Cameron Dillard picked up a loaded pistol from the ground at Newport Arms Apartments in Clinton Township. He was alerted to the fact that the child had a weapon in his hand but did nothing. Prosecutors say Johnson had been showing off the pistol to neighbors shortly before the child found the weapon. Granted, it's not a premeditated murder charge, However, he was a felon in possession of a weapon, knowing that he should not be carrying a weapon, going to an area where several children were playing, showing that weapon to neighbors and in front of the children. A few hours after the little boy died, Johnson was arrested in Detroit by the Macomb County FBI Violent Crimes Task Force. The father of a three-year-old boy and eight-year-old girl, Johnson faces a long list of charges, including second-degree murder. It was shocking that my nephew did this. You see what I'm saying? I don't know what was in his mind at the point in time, but he's no, he knows what, from right from wrong. And Johnson has also been charged with felony firearms possession and carrying a concealed weapon. In fact, he was on parole for a prior weapons conviction and remains behind bars on a $1 million bond. Reporting live, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. That's no, no doubt part of what prosecutors are looking at here, though. Priya Johnson has spent time behind bars before. Yeah, dating back to 2006, he has a number of convictions for attempted felony break-in, a number of drug convictions, including for heroin and cocaine possession, along with those weapons convictions. So a lengthy criminal history, and he will remain behind bars. All right, Priya. Well, last night's storms sure packed a punch and thousands are still feeling the effects. Right now, 32,000 customers are still without power after last night's storm. Outages are concentrated in Monroe, Washtenaw and southern Wayne counties. In addition to the outages, there has been damage to trees, cars and homes. They say most customers should have power by the end of the night tonight. Hopefully that's true. And luckily yeah. the rain and storms are moving out so those power crews can move in and get to work. So we bring in Ben with a cooling trend coming our way, Ben. You got that right. Uh, definitely not a summer feel as we head into the weekend. Almost completely done with that rain. We've got a couple sprinkles that have been hanging out around Gross Hills. They make their way east and some more showers a little bit further north starting to move into Lake Huron. May get a shower starting to push into Sandlot County here within the next 30 minutes or so. The cold front has yet to move through. So even though temperatures are still on the cool side. Humidity has yet to break those numbers out there mid to upper 70s right now, but we will feel a difference tonight and especially as you wake up tomorrow morning as we get through the weekend. Temperatures get even cooler than those numbers that we've got out there right now. Shower chances are going to return, but the big question is when will it finally warm up? We'll see if we can nail that down in the seven day forecast coming up. Guys. All right, Ben, now let's get to brand new information in the terror attack in Flint. Today, doctors at Hurley Medical Center delivered an update on Lieutenant Jeff Neville's condition. He's the airport police officer who was stabbed in the attack. Our Coco McAvoy was there. As doctors say, he's quickly recovering. A trauma doctor walked us through Lieutenant Neville's treatment process here at Hurley Medical Center. He says Lieutenant Neville is doing much better and his wound is healing. He's continued to make good progress. Surgeon Donald Schulten gave a detailed timeline of Lieutenant Jeff Neville's recovery, starting from the moment hospital staff was alerted to the attack. Officer Neville was alert. Uh, but was in some distress. That after a man stabbed Lieutenant Neville in the neck with a large knife, Neville fought back but suffered from a very deep cut. That extended all the way from the anterior part of his neck up by his uh, 
if you will, the Adam's apple, extended all the way to the posterior aspect of his neck. The laceration was life-threatening and could have left Neville in worse condition. Was probably very, very close to severing his major artery and nerve, perhaps even his windpipe and, uh, and uh, digestive system. Scholten says throughout the entire process, Neville remained calm. He was uh, uh, cooperative. He uh, appeared to understand the situation he was in. And most importantly, Lieutenant Neville's condition continues to improve after the unexpected attack. He's alert, awake, has uh, resumed his usual, uh, I believe, uh, uh, congenial disposition and has been a, uh, a really excellent patient. Out here live now, Lieutenant Neville is expected to be released from the hospital within the next couple of days. Back to you. Certainly good news there, Coco. Does it appear that he'll have any long term physical effects from this? So doctors expect him to make a full recovery. However, right now he is struggling to do things like smile or chew food. So they have him on a soft food diet. And of course, all of us are wishing him the best as he continues his recovery. Yep, and it's going to take some time, but thankfully it wasn't uh, any worse than what it was and he's going to be okay. Coco, we appreciate it. Right. Well, he's going to trial. That's the word from an Ingham County courtroom late today. Sports physician Dr. Larry Nasser has been bound over on 12 sexual assault charges. And for the first time, we heard from Nasser himself. Let's get to Mara McDonald. Some very important video was played in court, Mara. It sure was, Devin. It was Nasser being interviewed by an MSU detective. And for the first time, we get to hear how he explains what happened in those treatment rooms. Take a listen. I try my best to be appropriate, professional. Dr. Larry Nasser being interviewed by a detective from the Michigan State University Police who lays the allegations of sexual assault out in front of him, questioning him about his vaginal penetration of multiple female athletes, currently dozens of former athletes, both from his gymnastic days and employment at MSU, are alleging he would use his hands to sexually assault them, all while having visible erections. I'm not purposely trying to, to get a Nasser told the detective he wasn't looking for sexual satisfaction, but that's exactly what the attorney general's office is alleging Nasser did do. And now a judge has bound him over on 12 different counts of sexual assault in connection with six different athletes, all who were young girls at the time. Nasser was considered the gold standard in care. He convinced these girls that this was some type of legitimate treatment by the mere fact of who he was and how he was doing it so easily. Why would they ever question him? Why would they question this gymnastics god as an 11 and a 12, a 14 year old, a 13 year old with very limited life experience to compare it to? Back here alive, these criminal charges that were bound over for trial today are just the beginning for Dr. Nasser. Realize that there are easily a hundred women who are looking to sue him civilly and potentially Devin and Kimberly. We could have more criminal charges against him as well. Back to you. That's what's so important to remember in this case, Mar. This is just a portion of what Nasser is facing, really. That's right, because he also has a child pornography case, not yeah. in circuit court, but in federal court. So he's facing a mind boggling amount of legal wrangling in yeah. front of him, yeah. criminal as well as civil. Back to long, you. Long, long way to go. All right, Mara. All right, now to a local four update, and this one is a good one. Lobbyist Matt Micah is out of the ICU and got a visit from a special guest. During Micah's road to recovery, Washington Nationals player Jason Worth dropped by the hospital to see him. Micah, a Michigan native, has been upgraded to good condition after he was shot multiple times during the attack at a congressional baseball practice last week. Great smile there, and um, don't worry, he is a Tigers fan. I was going to say, he did yeah. make that clear. <laughs> made it clear last when week. I was in D.C. A lot of his colleagues were talking about how he'd <laughs> often show up and have a Tigers hat on. So but that's a great be, moment, that's, great visit, that's really fantastic. nice. Yeah. Well, still to come today, he is a well-known Detroit pastor and a member of the Detroit Police Board. So why does he have a bone to pick with police? New here at 5, the unusual and, thing that happened um, when Bishop down, Edgar Van uh, got pulled over, that has him demanding answers. Paula?
Hi guys, it's fireworks time, and you know what that means, it's fireworks time. Of course they're saying the show is bigger and better, but they're shrouded in mystery. But I've been getting my Paula on and digging for answers, and I got a few. I'll share them. Paula knows, <laughs> there's no doubt. But first, do you recognize this man? What police say he did was something that definitely wasn't his. Next. She's in. New at 6. Hundreds of families are about to face a big decision as the city tries to make room for the Gordie Howe Bridge. New at 6, hear from one of the homeowners weighing an enticing offer to move out. Also, the man in charge of the Metro Parks and their $50 million budget has been suspended. At 6, what we're hearing about why George Pfeiffer isn't in charge for the time being. Police in Westland need your help finding a debit card thief. Police are looking for the man that you are about to see pictured here. They say he charged $600 at a mire on Warren Road in Westland. The owner of the card says her card was used without her consent. If you recognize this man, you are asked to call Westland Police. Ooh, ah, we're just three days away from the Ford Fireworks lighting up the riverfront, and as always, Local 4 is your home for all the coverage coming up on Monday night. As you can see, the countdown clock is ticking down, and work is in full swing right now to make sure this year's fireworks go off without a hitch. Indeed, Paula Tutman has a sneak peek of what you can expect to see this year, Paula. So, of course, this year there have been challenges. I mean, take a look at these storm clouds gathering over here. And yeah, it's created a few small delays, but these guys are back at work as usual. Of course, the clock is ticking, and every single year they say, oh, it's bigger. Oh, it's better. And every single year it is. The clock is ticking, and Zambelli Fireworks is at it again, giving preferential treatment to Detroit. After 25 years, it is still not old. In fact, the genius behind our fireworks is that they find a way to make it new and great every year. But this year, in just getting started, the craftsmen and artisans had to do a little dance with Mother Nature. Off and on and off and on. This is worse than, than knowing that it's going to rain all the time, because knowing that it's going to rain all the time, you get set up as if it's going to rain. If it's not, then it's off, then you get super hot under the, the plastic tarps, and the, you want to get out, you want to get in. This year's big Ford Fireworks Detroit show is shrouded in mystery. We're not going to tell you what it is. I probed deeper. Get your seatbelt fastened at the very beginning. That's all we're going to tell you about that. I probed deeper still, and I can finally tell you that I got some answers on the new big thing. The wind comes up, we kind of lose the integrity of trying to do letters and things in the sky and this technology will allow it to stay together and look very, very sharp. Personalizes it, and when it happens, it's quick. I mean, we have two people working two days to set it up, to prep it, and it's gonna last a total of 4.5 seconds in the show. So that's a lot of work for, for very little time, but it's high impact. It has not been used in this country before. And it's going to involve spelling some things in the sky. That's as far as we're going to go. One will be in the middle, and one will be at the very, very end. Okay, so obviously there's still some mystery. We got a little bit, a little bit out of uh, Tony Michaels. But here's the thing. We now know, obviously, that the golden hour is 9.55, 9.55 on Monday. I'm told that there is a grand entrance as well as a grand finale, and you've got to stay tuned throughout the whole thing to see this new thing that they promise will wow us. And every time they promise, I, I got to tell you guys, they deliver. There's no doubt about it. They always do. But we're going to spell things in the sky, Paula, so this year there's a test. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what it'll be. <laughs> All right, Paula. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Thank you. Uh, the spectacular Ford Fireworks is Monday. The show is packed with stars and music and all the effects. You just yeah, heard. and speaking of stars, you'll hear Detroit duets all night long featuring some familiar faces, including our very own Evrod Kasmi singing with Thornetta Davis. And Devin, you're going to do a duet with Jill Jack, so well, that's going to be Jill really Jack. cool, too. We were discussing what you should wear, if you should wear your tight um, <laughs> cowboy, cowboy jeans. jeans. 
or, or the white ones that you wore a few years ago that <laughs> apparently people are still They're talking notori. about. Oh, yes. They came to fame of their own. I'm oh. really looking forward to it, though. It's my first one. I hear that it's fantastic, it's and be, it, uh, yeah. I know you're going to do great. Always it's going to be fun. fun. But yeah. as we just heard, this is it's been interesting. The weather's causing problems just for them getting set up. Yeah. It's interesting. No shorts on Monday. Yeah, no. Regardless no. of whether we stay dry or not, it's going to be cool. That was what Ben had last year. That's right? true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we won't be doing that again, uh, but we will possibly be seeing more of this rainfall. I wanted to look back at the last 48 hours uh, because, again, this was a haves and have not situation. Officially at the airport, 11 one hundredths of an inch is all we got, and all those blue spaces are spots that picked up less than an inch. There were a couple big winners here uh, from the city south. Uh, right around Monroe picked up almost two inches there. Estimates of about an inch and a half around Dearborn. And then you get into our north zone, and that's where we saw a little bit more in the way of wet weather. A lot of this fell this morning, anywhere from about an inch and a half to close to two. Nowhere near what they picked up between Midland and Mount Pleasant. Estimates of four to seven inches of rain. They still have flood warnings out, especially for the Titabawassee River could be seeing major flooding that's expected to rise another six feet on top of what they've got already. These guys are happy. It's about the only people that are uh, the ducks out in Belleville. Uh, thanks for that uh, storm pin shot. That's from Victoria and uh, we'll love to see how you uh, celebrate the weekend with these cooler temperatures that we've got going. Now we do have some clearing skies uh, eventually tonight, but we're starting to get some of these high clouds from what's left over from Cindy. Uh, so I'm starting to maybe rethink that nighttime forecast may not get as cool as what we're thinking, but nevertheless, the cold front will come through and it will drop the humidity as we get into tomorrow morning. But Saturday afternoon and Sunday, we both have shower chances to see those in the afternoon. Depending on how much instability, how much cold air comes in, there may be a couple rumbles out there, but generally this should be just showers. We're not anticipating anything severe. Sunday, we're going to see those showers bloom again in the afternoon, and unfortunately for fireworks Monday can't rule out a shower as well. Overnight lows at 61. Right now we've got the skies clearing, but again, we may have to revisit that depending on those clouds from Cindy. High temperatures tonight or tomorrow, I should say, going to 77 in the city. And generally, we're not going to see a whole lot of difference across our zones in high temperatures tomorrow, but slightly cooler than what we picked up today. Mid 70s there in our south zone. West zone, if those showers get an early start on you, these could be a little bit cooler, but generally low to mid 70s. And same goes for our north zone for high temperatures tomorrow. We take another step downward as we get into Sunday, so upper 60s to low 70s across the area. Monday is going to be the coolest at 71, and we finally break that pattern on Tuesday. Get a little bit sun, uh, more sunshine in here, dry out, and watch those numbers go the other direction as the 80s finally show up on Wednesday. So uh, I said in my push alert, false start on summer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we thought. Yeah, that's exactly start. right. We'll, we'll try that again <laughs> no. next week. Okay, Ben. Let's get over to Dr. Frank McGeorge. Something outdoors is sending lots of people to the doctor's office this week, and it's not just the pollen. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. See what's going around and how to avoid it. All right, Frank, but first, a mystery unfolding tonight after a body is found in an alley. That's next. Detroit police are searching for answers after a body was found today on the city's west side. The body was found around 7 o'clock this morning in an alley behind St. Vincent de Paul on Grand River near Montrose Street. Details on the person's identity have not been released. It's also unclear how the body got there and how the individual died. Troy firefighters battled a fire this morning at Oakland Mall. Hours before opening time, we're told a driver reported seeing flames on the roof of the Sears store. Firefighters responded pretty quickly. They were able to stop the fire from spreading. The cause still under investigation now. Also at Oakland Mall today, a rally reminding drivers to move over. The event is part of a national movement known as the American Spirit Ride, which brings awareness to move over laws. The laws were put into place in U.S. states, including here in Michigan, to ensure a clear, safe path for police and first responders on the scene of accidents. If you look at MSP wise, most of our officers that are falling in the line of duty wasn't from gunshot wounds or fighting with bad guys or things like that. It's because they were hit by a car. The move over law requires all drivers to move over at least one lane when approaching a traffic accident. New at 530. Healthcare battle once again taking center stage here in Washington. Will Republicans get the votes? Here in the city of Fraser, they've got some amazing recreation classes for senior citizens, even young reporters. Not so young, honestly. It could all end because of budget cuts. 
We'll tell you why one township thinks they could save all of this. We have details of a controversial traffic stop right here of Bishop Edgar Van. This was probably the first time that I've ever felt any kind of a fear, me personally, uh, any kind of a fear with a police stop. Next, my talk with Bishop Van and what Detroit police have to say. It's dinner time. Live from downtown Detroit, local four news at 530 starts now. A well-known Detroit pastor and member of the police board says a police officer pulled a gun on him during a traffic stop and he wants to know why. It tops our news tonight at 530. Bishop Edgar Van says he when he was pulled over last week in downtown Detroit, he says officers not only demanded he roll down all of his windows and take the keys out of his ignition. Van also says an officer approached his vehicle with his gun drawn, all because that officer says he ran a red light. Sean Lay talked with Bishop Van, who is not very happy about what happened, Sean. He is not right now. He's asking for some answers in all this as we have a siren, so I'll speak up. But what's interesting is, is that Pastor Van tells me that he's been teaching at his church young men how to handle traffic stops. This time, though, it was Pastor Van who was stopped right here at Larned and Woodward here on the corner. He says it's a traffic stop that has really shaken him up. This was probably the first time that I've ever felt any kind of a fear, me personally. Uh, any kind of a fear with a police stop. Bishop Edgar Van says it happened last Thursday at 5.30 p.m. in front of the city county building. He says a Detroit police officer pulled him over, then pulled his gun. And he got out of the car, pulled his gun, and brandished it on his chest with his finger in the trigger. Like this. Like this. Van serves on the Board of Police Commissioners. He was leaving a board meeting. When he was stopped, he says the officer said he ran a red light. Even before the officer got out of his cruiser, he was sending orders. He came on the loudspeaker. Uh, he, he asked me to pull over and asked me to roll down my windows. Van wants to know if all stops are this aggressive. Chief Craig says high risk stops can be. That's when guns are drawn for officer safety. In this case, the chief says the officer pulled Van over for the red light and for tinted windows. The officer was not out looking for a violent offender. If there's something that we did wrong, uh, we certainly want to be able to take uh, corrective action. However, uh, if we did nothing wrong, then uh, we can address that as well. This is one of the reasons why tensions are high uh, in a lot of urban areas with regard to police stops. Now back here live, the chief says Pastor Van got three citations. The pastor says he only got one for not having insurance, but he says he does have insurance. The officer simply refused to look at his insurance card and handed him the citation for not having insurance. The pastor says he would like now to hear from Chief Craig when possible. The chief says he certainly will be reaching out to him once he has all the facts of the traffic stop. Devin. Well, with the varying versions of what happened here, Sean, I guess I'm wondering if there's in-car video of, of what happened. You know, there's not, and the chief's not happy about that. The camera broken inside that particular cruiser. However, right down here, you know where we are, right next to the city county building. There's oh, sure. cameras everywhere. They're yep. going to be reviewing uh, all the footage they, they can find on this one. We'll see. All right, Sean. Well, it is hot and humid out there today. Super sticky. That's about the only part of summer that we still have left because the rest of it seems to have gone away. Oh, so we're keeping the best part <laughs> <laughs> for a little while because yeah. that's going to change too. Uh, but here's the latest on Fort Live radar. Uh, we'll show you that in just a second. We'll get you caught up on temperatures though first. Uh, close to average, but a little bit below out there, mid 70s. So even though the humidity levels are still high, it's not necessarily oppressive out there. So relatively comfortable, but you can see all those clouds hanging around and probably will for a good chunk of the evening hours tonight. The only spot where there's still rain hanging out is up here in Santa Lake County. There's one lone shower right there around Marlette making its way out towards Lake Erie. As that exits, cold front will chase that out, eventually take that humidity with it. So by the time we wake up tomorrow morning, things are going to feel a lot different. Not only is it going to be cooler, but it is going to be less humid. Uh, we'll start clearing these guys out a little bit by 10 o'clock, but expect a lot of these high clouds to remain through the evening. And we'll talk about even cooler temperatures for the weekend coming up in a few minutes. Devin? The battle over health care back on tonight in Washington. Republican senators pushing, uh, trying to get their plan through before the end of next week. But questions about Russia lingering anew with President Trump making new comments about the investigation. Blaine Alexander is at the White House. Blaine? Well, Devin, President Trump today signing one bill to protect veterans, while on Capitol Hill, Republicans are divided on another. 
health care. Thank you very much. With wounded warriors looking on, President Trump taking steps to protect the nation's veterans. This is one of the largest reforms to the VA in its history. Signing a bill to make it easier to fire bad VA employees. Veterans were put on secret wait lists, given the wrong medication, given the bad treatments. Touting it as another campaign promise fulfilled as he casts doubt over the investigation into his campaign and possible Russian collusion. Hours after admitting he does not have taped conversations between himself and fired FBI Director James Comey, the president questioning the credibility of special counsel Robert Mueller in an interview with Fox News. Well, he's very, very good friends with uh, Comey, uh, which is very bothersome. The people that have been hired are all Hillary Clinton supporters. And suggesting, again, that he may have been a target of Obama administration surveillance. While over on Capitol Hill, the fight continues to end Obama's signature piece of legislation, a health care battle now between Republicans. Do they want our votes or they don't want our votes? The bill has to get better and has to get more to our liking. The bill is to the president's liking, the White House says. The question now, how hard will he personally push to get all Republicans on board? And right now, Republicans do not have the votes to get that through the Senate, but leaders are hoping to turn that around and get a vote by the end of next week. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine, one more note. Uh, the battle between the White House and the press corps over continued refusals to hold on-camera briefings has hit a new level, with CNN taking a not very veiled shot by what they did today. The network hired a courtroom sketch artist to draw these sketches of the briefing today at the White House. Reporters who were there were only allowed to record it with audio devices. The Trump administration has increasingly cut back on press briefings and live press access over the last couple of weeks. Police in London say the fire at a high-rise apartment building that left at least 79 people dead last week was caused by a faulty refrigerator. The appliance was previously under recall, investigators say. More testing on the freezer in the fire will be done. Police have also learned the insulation and the tiles in the 24-story tower had failed fire safety tests. Sandra, I'm shocked you're here today because a lot of people are packing up the cooler and blowing up the <laughs> inner tubes and the rafts because today is the Jobby Nooner. Thousands of people heading to Gull Island on Lake St. Clair. It's the 43rd annual Jobby Nooner. The event takes place on the final Friday in June. It was started back in the 80s by some of Detroit's auto industry employees looking for a summer getaway. And as you can see, <laughs> plenty of <laughs> folks even on a cloudier day than they might have liked. Hopefully the rain holds off. You know me, I'm a partier. I know. I'm so glad you came to work <laughs> to be with me today instead. As we first uh, started reporting last week, City of Frazier is facing a nearly $2 million budget deficit. And because of that sharp shortfall, the city could lose six police officers. The Parks and Recreation Department and the Senior Center might also have to close, but a meeting today could change all that. As Nick Monticelli reports from Frazier, Clinton Township leaders are now offering to step in to try to keep those programs running. Let me set the stage for you just a little bit. Not that it's an issue with this, but just so you know, the sinkhole is right in the front parking lot. Not a problem in this story, though. So come on back inside here. This is the activity center and the senior center in Fraser. They have pickleball, they have bridge, they have youth camps and summer programs almost every single day. They could lose all of that unless they find a way to partner with the latest person trying to help. That's Clinton Township. Zero four one. Don Conkle spends a lot of his time pickleballing if that's a word. Oh, it's great. That's a lot of fun. We're enjoying get some exercise, too. But he... That's a terrible hand. <laughs> it is <laughs> And the rest of the seniors at the Fraser Center are very concerned. Where will they bridge? Who will plan trips or movie days? This is because Fraser's nearly $2 million deficit has the senior center and parks and rec programs on the chopping block. So no more summer camps, sports teams, Easter egg hunts, or Christmas parties. Oh, terrible. You know, uh, uh, we're hoping we can uh, find another place. But the Clinton Township Supervisor is hoping to help by combining programs. Fraser, though, will have to find room in the budget to pay Clinton Township. And we have the resources. We have uh, an award-winning Parks and Rec program and director who has a wonderful staff. Adding a few more programs is not going to hamper him. Another reason the township is interested is because many Clinton Township residents live closer to Fraser events and facilities. 
Fraser Councilwoman Yvette Foster thinks this will work and could maybe save more jobs. I believe that we could maybe, maybe save more than one public safety officer by doing this. Again, we don't have anything on the table. We don't know the numbers and what, the, um, what they're offering. But those here hope an agreement can be made because without these programs and facilities, they're not sure where they'll go. I think once the city loses its recreation department, it kind of loses something about the whole city. In Fraser, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. And we know at least one Fraser City Councilwoman says she's concerned. Kathy Blank says it's an interesting idea, but it's she's most concerned about everything that's already in place, like the planned events and the games or the payments that have already been made. Of course, we're going to let you know when a decision is made. Uh, sticky. Uh, the warnings have been coming for years, and now there is new reason for alarm. Coming up new here at 530, the urgent warning being issued tonight about the future of the Great Lakes. Also, get ready to get down on the riverfront ahead here at 530. We're uh, heading to GM River Days. We'll show you the biggest and best reasons you don't want to miss out on this year's edition. Doc? Something outdoors is sending lots of people to the doctors this week, and it's not just the pollen. I'm Dr. Frank George. See what's going around and how to avoid it. Jeopardy has